Hello there and welcome to Accounting 2208, Tutorial 22-1 on the Statement of Cash Flows. This tutorial will focus on the preparation of the Statement of Cash Flows for the Quartz Company example using the indirect approach. So as always, make sure that you download the correct um, uh, problem file so that you can follow along. And what I've done here is uh, I've included just the other data set so that we can see where some of the information that we are using for these calculations come from. So you'll see this in the top corner or down at the bottom. Um, so when we first prepare our statement, we begin with the title. So the proper title is Quartz Company Statement of Cash Flows uh, for the year ended December 31st, 2014. Again, for the year ended is very important, just like the income statement, it covers a period of time. Do not use as at because as at is at a point in time and that's used for the balance sheet. So the first section of the cash flow statement is the operating activity section where we will look at uh, identifying all the cash flows from operating the company or, or uh, cash flows used by the company in operations. Our first line item is we begin with net income and from the data we see here our net income is uh, $2,950. Okay, so once we identify our net income, we now have a section for non-cash adjustments, and these would be basically any adjustments that we make to net income for items that were not actually exchanged for cash. So we would have non-cash revenues and expenses or non-cash gains and losses. And so uh, conventionally, we usually begin with depreciation and amortization expense. So in this question, we are told that the amortization expense on the patent uh, amounted to $25. So basically we just put that right in. However, sometimes you have to kind of find stuff out. And so an alternative uh, way to determine what the depreciation or amortization is on a capital asset is to reconstruct the accumulated depreciation account. So for this one, we have accumulated amortization on the patent. And if we look at the data, we know that the beginning of year accumulated amortization is 25 and the end of year accumulated amortization is 50. Now, you want to be looking for something in the data that refers to perhaps uh, the asset being sold because when we dispose of an asset, we have to make sure that we remove any accumulated depreciation. In this case, there isn't any. And so to go from a beginning balance of 25 to an ending balance of 25 means that the amortization expense had to be uh, 25 as well. 25, put this here. This had to be the amortization expense. Okay, so after amortization expense, now we have depreciation expense. And our depreciation expense um, if you look in the data that's provided, we don't have an income statement. Now, uh, a lot of problems are you would have seen will give you both a balance sheet and an income statement. You, at the very least, must have a balance sheet and you need a comparative balance sheet. This problem doesn't give us a balance sheet, but it does give us the other data. So because we just can't go and look to the balance sheet to find the depreciation expense, we're going to have to reconstruct the accumulated depreciation account for the equipment. And in the same way that we <laughs> proved that the amortization expense previously was 25, we're going to have to uh, reconstruct this account to determine what the accumulated depreciation is. So we know that the beginning balance as provided is 680 and the ending balance is 920. And our depreciation expense will be this number right here. However, if you look and see at the additional data here, we are told that equipment costing $600 and amortized 70% was sold during the year for a gain. So what we have to do is um, uh, calculate what this accumulated depreciation is on the asset that's sold. And in this case, it tells us that if the original cost was 600 and it's depreciated 70%, that means that the accumulated depreciation on this had to be 420, so this is 420. So now I have enough information to determine what my depreciation expense is. If I take 920 uh, plus 420 minus 680, 
I will end up with $660 in accumulated depreciation. Um, and always double check to make sure because if you did the math wrong going backwards then you won't get the correct answer. To prove, always take 680 uh, plus 660 minus 420 should give you 920. Okay, so start from the top and work your way back down. All right, next up. Um, so these two would basically exhaust any uh, amortization or depreciation. So now we look at gains and losses for which no cash is exchanged. So we are told from uh, this additional item that there is a uh, loss on disposal of a fair value through net income investment. And it tells us what the loss actually is so we don't have to calculate it. So 200 is the uh, loss that we put in. Sometimes you may have to calculate the gain or loss. Um, so uh, you would be able to de determine that if you knew what the proceeds uh, were from the sale minus the cost, of course, will give you a gain or loss. What we know here is that the investments have a value of 600, but that doesn't quite tell us enough information. Is that what the, uh, well, I guess we presume that that's uh, what the, either the market value or the value in the actual T account Actually, no, if we look at our data, we know that the value in the T account is 900, and, 900. Now, there could have been some other purchases during the year, so we have to be very careful uh, depending on the kind of information we have. So, But uh, the gain or loss here is 200 proceeds. We're not quite sure yet because we haven't determined that. We may not even need to. We actually do need to, but we'll see that come later. Um, and uh, we would figure out what the cost is. And this same approach actually applies to, let's say, the sale of, of uh, uh, capital assets. So the proceeds on the sale of uh, equipment minus the net book value on equipment gives us a gain or loss. Now you notice I didn't cross out this other piece because there are actually still some information that we need. We could have included it, I guess, up here. Uh, right after we determined what the depreciation expense on, on the equipment was. But nevertheless, um, that equipment that was sold during the year was sold for a gain of 300. So we have to add back, sorry, we have to subtract the gain. Okay, so you can see what's going on here. To our net income, we have to add back amortization, add back depreciation, and add back losses because these items are expenses and they reduce our uh, net income. And we have to get our net income back to a cash-based number. So we have to add back all the non-cash expenses. But what we have here is a gain. And so gains actually inflate right, our uh, net income. So if we didn't have the gain, then income would be lower. So what we have to do is we have to subtract um, subtract the $300 gain on the sale of the equipment to drop the, um, the income. Next, we are told that um, the company owns an investment in some associate and the equity method is used to record the company's share of net income. So you should recall this from the previous level course where we look at investments. And if you recall with the equity method of investments, what happens is the company's proportionate share of its investment in the associate, right? So the investment, um, we always debit the investment account and credit any uh, uh, revenue or earnings, right? Our proportionate share of the earnings. So the journal entry for this transaction originally would have been a $1,300 debit to the investment associate. So debit investment in quartz, no, sorry, in razor, 1,300. And there would be a uh, credit to investment revenue for 1,300. So this, 1300 in revenue in earnings that is recognized using the equity approach right isn't actually cash remember that with these kinds of investments we don't actually get any cash for our proportionate share that's why we're increasing the investment where the cash comes from uh, would be from any dividends the associate paid so if the associate paid you know x dollars in dividends and we own 20 percent then we get 20 percent of the dividend of course the dividend um, is credited to the investment account 
and uh, that's when cash would be debited and there would be no income statement impact for uh, dividends okay and that's why so there would be no non-cash adjustment for dividends uh, here okay so then we have to subtract the equity earnings to continue to reduce our income so these are all the items in our problem that represent basically non-cash adjustments and what we're going to do now is look at strictly at changes in the balance sheet um, in current uh, assets and current liabilities which makes up working capital and so some um, uh, statements may have a slight a small subsection here that looks at changes in working capital and so all we do now basically is go through our income sorry go through our balance sheet through current assets and current liabilities okay uh, to look at the changes in those accounts so the data tells us we have our accounts receivable it started with a beginning balance of 100 on the debit side and end up with a balance of 450 and so that change is a $350 increase and now make sure you get these right students always confuse these uh, when your accounts receivable goes up your clients or customers are using you as a bank and so you're not collecting you're not turning those receivables into cash it makes more sense to students the other way if you start with 450 and end up with 100 well that means you collected money you turned it into cash and so in that case you would add the change so when we see any increases in assets increases in current assets that means we have to subtract uh, uh, subtract on our on the cash flow statement right because it represents a cash outflow so increases in assets or outflows decreases in assets or inflows and the opposite is true when we look at liabilities okay increases in liabilities are actually inflows and decreases in liabilities are cash outflows so we have a $350 increase in accounts receivable that we have to subtract next item on the list is inventory inventory went from 125 280 so inventory went from 125 all the way to 180 and that should be a change of 55 and again because it increased we basically took cash and bought inventory and so now that cash is being tied up in inventory so we have to subtract it as a cash outflow the next um, uh, item in the uh, current asset section is fair value through net income investments however investments um, regardless of whether they are classified as current or not are captured in the investing section so make sure that you don't confuse that and include it in the current asset section so we're actually going to skip fair value through net income investments right skip the fv and i uh, investment and go right to prepaids similar to inventory and accounts receivable the prepaid uh, went from uh, 25 all the way up to 200 so that is a net increase of 175 the asset is going up so the increase in the prepaid is a cash outflow so we have to subtract the 175 dollar difference and that's it for current uh, assets so now and we can even just sort of draw a line here and let's say this is separates the assets and now we're into the liabilities if we look at our accounts payable balance accounts payable went from 320 to 435 so don't forget that those are credit balance 320 to 435 we owe our customers money um, good for us bad for them because we're basically keeping our money for a while and so that is a 115 net change and because we are using our customers money and not paying them as quickly that's considered a cash outflow so we add the increase in accounts payable of 115. and then the last liability um, in our last current liability is wages payable um, we don't include um, uh, dividends 
uh, uh, payable um, in this section um, because the company is treating as financing activities on the statement of cash flows. So this problem only has accounts payable and wages payable as the two current liabilities. The wages payable here went Uh, from 555 to 1425, 555, all the way to 1425. So that's a net change of 870. The liability is going up. Uh, so we're using our uh, uh, employees as bankers, if you want to look at it that way. And so we have to add the 870. And that's it for current assets liability. So we started with our net income, we made our non-cash adjustments, and now we did all of our adjustments related to working capital. And so this means that um, doing all the math, our operating activities have provided the company with $2,640 in cash. Okay, so now we move on to the investing section. That's usually the second section. Sometimes uh, some people prefer to put the financing in uh, the financing section second. It really doesn't matter as long as the operating activity section comes first. So in investing, we're looking basically at long-term assets, right, uh, and any investments. Uh, and so those would be investments, actual investments. So. Uh, bonds, equities, or um, equipment and other long-term assets, equipment and long-term assets. Okay, so going back to some of the other information we'll need again, just because we crossed it out for use in the activity section doesn't mean that we're finished using them. So we see here that um, uh, fair value through net income investments with a value of 600 were sold at, for a loss of 200. So if you look at the balance sheet, I mean, the, the balance at the end of 2014 is 900 and it started the year with 150. So some of the investments were sold, but not all of them. And what we know from the data provided is that they had a value of 600. So we could say that that is um, uh, our cost. And we know that they were sold for a loss of 200. So the question is, what are the proceeds? Well, in um, one of the previous slides, I was saying that we can actually use our formula, proceeds minus cost is equal our gain or loss. Okay? And so we put in what we know. We don't know the proceeds. We know the cost is 600, and we know that the loss is 200. Well, in order to end up with a $200 loss on something that costs 600, that means that the proceeds had to be 400 and that's what it is so and that's cash in we sold the investment for 400 the next item relates to the purchase of a fair value through net income investment now notice that our other data doesn't mention any purchases no mention so how do we know there was well we have to make sure that we construct our fair value through net, net our fair value through net income investment asset on our balance sheet. So if we look at our investment FV through net income account um, investment, we reconstruct it to say, okay, well we know at the beginning of the year that was 150. We know at the end of the year it was 900. We know from the previous part. Um, that the equipment costing 600, so not equipment costing, the fair value investment costing 600 was sold. So 600 had to have been removed from here. And so by reconstructing our balance sheet, right, if we take 150 minus 600, we do not get $900. So that means something happened here. There had to be a debit, and that debit would have to have been a purchase of investments. And so if we work backwards and say, okay, 900 plus 600 minus 150, that will give us 1,350. And double check, 150 plus 1350 minus 600 is 900. And that's where this 1350 comes from. Now, 
this is presumed to have been purchased in cash. And so while we are debiting the investment account, of course, we're going to have to have credited cash. And so that is a outflow. So we have to subtract the 1350 on the purchase of the fair value investment. Okay, so next item is uh, determining if there are any proceeds from the sale of any other assets. And we did sell equipment. And what we know is that equipment with a cost of 600 is sold uh, for a gain of 300 and that equipment was amortized 70%. So using the formula we used just previously, proceeds minus, but instead of saying cost, when we're dealing with assets, we subtract our net book value. And the proceeds minus net, net, net book value is a gain or, or loss. And our net book value is calculated as cost minus accumulated depreciation. So we know that on this asset, our cost was 600 because it's told us that our equipment is a cost of 600 and the accumulated depreciation is 70% of that or 420. And if you recall, when we dealt with the depreciation uh, calculation here, that's where we also use that number, the 600 times 70%. So if we know that the proceeds, so here we'll call this X because we don't know that what that is. Let me get rid of this here. Do this. The proceeds X minus 600 minus 420, which is net book value, that is going to equal a gain of 300. So if we finish out our math here, we say X minus uh, 180 because that's what uh, 600 minus 420 is must equal 300. Well, X equals 300 plus 180, which is 480. And so we can just go back and prove that, if you're not sure, 480 proceeds minus um, the 180 net book value gives us a $300 gain. So we know we did it correctly. And we're adding that as a cash inflow in the investing section. Now we have to determine if there were any other um, uh, purchases uh, or uh, um, uh, sales of any other uh, assets. And so what you should be doing as we progress along here is making sure that we have essentially reconstructed all of the long-term asset accounts. So we've constructed the fair value through a net income account, but now we have to reconstruct the equipment account because if we look at our equipment asset, what do we know? We know that the equipment had a beginning balance of 1300. We know that the ending value of the equipment is 3340. And from our previous work and from the data, equipment costing 600 was sold. So if you remember from your uh, intro and prerequisite uh, intermediate course, that when we have a disposal of an asset, right? We must, of course, credit the cost and debit the accumulated depreciation for that. And so that's where this $600 credit comes from. And so looking at our T account here, um, 1300 minus six does not equal 3340. So there's a number that's missing. Well, this must have been a purchase of an asset during the year. So if we work backwards and take 3340 plus 600 minus 1300, we end up with 2640 as the cash paid to purchase equipment. Okay. Now be very careful. Uh, this example is pretty straightforward, but sometimes you could have data that says, um, uh, you know, one piece of equipment was paid for in because let's say that this uh, piece of equipment uh, is actually two. So you have uh, uh, asset A and asset B. So we could say that asset B was sold for cash of a thousand and asset B was, let's say in exchange for shares, let's say for common shares. So that would mean that, uh, you know, 1640 would be the, the difference. Now the cash portion is what you would see in the cash flow, but this exchange for common shares is a non cash transaction. 
And so you actually don't see that in the investing activities. And I can't tell you how often students will just say, oh, okay, my plug for this equipment account is 2640. It's all cash. No, no. You have to look in the data to see if there are any asset uh, swaps in exchange for shares or for a bond, right? Which is also non-cash. So just really be aware of that. But in this case, our cash uh, paid for equipment because all of this uh, 2640 was paid in cash is subtracted, right? If we paid in cash, we have to deduct it. So that's a cash outflow in investing activities. So working our way down through the assets, we should be um, crossing off accounts receivable, inventory, net FENI investments is gone, prepaids, um, land had no change, actually no land, there is probably something we have to deal with with land to see if it says anything about that. Um, we'll see where we have to deal with that. So leave that one for now. Equipment we've done. Um, and now we have the patent. And so we have to reconstruct the T account for the patent. Again, the beginning balance of the patent is 105. The ending balance, 425. So that means that, uh, and, and the data doesn't say that there was anything sold. So there's nothing on the credit side. So all of this is $320. So the company purchased additional patents in cash for 320 so that's a subtraction uh, of cash cash outflow in the investing activity section so at this point we want to make sure that we've gone through every single one of our uh, asset accounts and the only ones that we didn't touch is land that's one of them and if you look at the land it went from zero to a thousand right which means that there had to be a debit of a thousand dollars however Looking at the liabilities and shareholders equity section, this land was donated because there is a balance in the contributed surplus for donated land for a thousand. So therefore this is non-cash. And then the last account on the list is that long-term investment, that long-term equity investment. So do T account for that long-term equity investment it had a beginning balance of 5,000 and ending balance of 6,300 so that means that there had to be a plug-in here for 1,300 and if we look at the data that 1,300 is actually right here so there were no um, dividends received in that because we would see if the dividends were received that there would be a credit on this side and then that would have been uh, debited to cash so there were no dividends from the associate so what this tells us then is we have gone through all of our assets we've covered the current assets in the operating section and the long-term assets here in the investing section and what this tells us is that our cash outflow for uh, investing activities is $3,430. So we have positive cash from um, operating activities and negative cash for investing activities. And basically the company is, uh, most of that, right, is um, related to the purchase of equipment and the purchase of a fair value through net income investment. And now our last section, the financing section, basically deals with any long-term liabilities and any shareholder equity. And this basically relates, and, and if you remember from your basic finance or early courses, the two ways that companies raise money are basically through debt and equity. So they take out bank loans or issue bonds or the company sell shares. If we look at the data, we know that a bond payable at the beginning of the year for 3,000 was paid during the year. So that means we have a $3,000 cash outflow for repayment of the bond payable. But if you construct a trustee T account for the bond payable, which you should always do, you'd see 
that the bond started with a balance of 3,000 and ended with a balance of 3,000. Now, if you were like a number of students that just look at the changes in the balances, then you're going to make mistakes. The only time you look at changes in balances of balance sheet accounts is only for current and uh, sorry current assets and current liabilities. You never ever just look at changes in the balances for long-term assets, investments, and long-term liabilities and equity. You must reconstruct the accounts because the beginning balance is the same as the ending balance. So you would look at that and say, well, there was no change, so therefore there was no cash. Well, that's not true, because what we know here is that a bond at the beginning of the year, right, uh, for 3,000 was paid. So if that was paid, cash would have been credited and the bond payable uh, debited. However, there's still a balance. Well, that means that the company must have issued new bonds. In this case, they happen to be for the same amount. So Basically, the company had bonds of 3,000 outstanding. It repurchased them and then issued new ones, right, to end up with the same amount. Now, you may go, well, that's, you just, what's the big deal? You forget about that. You know, if there's no change, why bother including it? Well, this is very important because from a user perspective, a user must know all of the information related to any transactions. So even though the change in the bond payable account is zero because the beginning ending balances are the same, what is very important is you see that there is stuff that's going on. So the company repurchased the bond, right? And the company issued a bond, right? So just because they're the same amount doesn't mean anything, right? Uh, the company could have repurchased the bond for 4,000 and issued a new one for 9,000 or whatever. But the point is, is that both of these must be shown and they must be disclosed separately, right? Do not combine them. So continuing to work our way through our liabilities and shareholders equity section. So we have dealt with the bonds. Now we look at the common shares and you'll see our common share account. have a beginning balance of 2100 and an ending balance of 3525. Well, in order for that to happen, something must have taken place and uh, there's no indication in this problem that there are any share repurchases, no repurchases of common shares. So there's nothing that happens on this side. So we can simply take the difference between the beginning and the ending balance here. This time we can do it, right? And that tells us that there is an issue of shares of 1425. And to prove 2100 plus 1425 is 3525. So cash proceeds from issue of shares. So we add 1425. So um, the common shares are taken care of, so you can stroke that one off on the balance sheet. Contributed surplus and donated land, well, um, there, there was, uh, there's no cash related to that because it was just simply a donation of land. So the contributed capital or contributed surplus account goes up and the land goes up, but there's no cash. So the last item, and it's always recommended, at least I recommend you save these to last or the dividends because the dividends are the ones that require the most work. And they're the, re the reason why they require the most work is that you must reconstruct two accounts. You have to reconstruct the retained earnings and you have to reconstruct the dividends payable account, right? This stuff isn't hard. You just have to make sure that you just follow through everything that you are doing. So, and the reason why we have to do this is because if you recall from previous courses, we have a beginning balance in our retained earnings of 825. We have an ending balance of 2805. We know our net income during the year as uh, provided is 2950, so 2950. But if we do the math, 825 uh, plus uh, 2950 does not equal 2805, right? It just doesn't. And that's because there was something on the right-hand side that happened here. And the only thing, at least for our concerns, or the most um, 
a common thing that we reduce retained earnings for are dividends. And now, so anything on the credit side could be cash dividends or stock dividends. So you should be looking for information in a problem that talks about were there any stock dividends because those are non-cash, okay? In this case, there are no stock dividends, so we don't have to worry about it. So in reconstructing our account, if we take 2805 minus 2950 minus the beginning uh, 825 will give us uh, 970. This is the cash dividend that was declared. Okay, Declared is not the same as paid. Okay, So, and this is a common mistake. Students figure out that, okay, I have to take the difference between the beginning and ending retained earnings factor in my net income. Oh, okay, and all I have to do is plug my retained, earning, retained earnings account, and that must be cash dividends paid. No, first mistake they make is assuming it's all cash, not checking for stock dividends. The second mistake they make is assuming that, okay, and even if they do catch a stock dividend, they say the rest is paid. No, that's why we need to look for a dividend payable account. If there is no dividend payable account, then all of the retained earnings that are declared are paid. So if no dividend payable account, then uh, dividends declared are the same as dividends paid, right? Because if there's no dividend payable liability, it means that there's no liability, right? So there's nothing to be paid. But in this case, there is a dividend payable account and our dividend payable starts with 200, has an ending balance of 145. So we know that our dividend of 970, right? We had to debit retained earnings and we credit, right? Dividend payable uh, for 970. So in order for our journal entry or sorry for our T account to balance, right? 200 plus 970 minus 145, or if you like to work backwards, 145 minus 970 minus 200 is 1,025. This is the dividend paid, right? It's always the debit amount in the dividend payable liability. And so that's where we have here this 1025 subtraction for cash dividends paid. So please make sure that you follow through this example uh, to, so that you get it because these are the most common places students make mistakes. It's not hard, but you just can't look at the beginning and ending balances because there's stuff that's going on behind the scenes. And so now if you go through your entire balance sheet, you will see that we have covered off every single account. We covered the um, current assets and current liabilities. We've covered the long-term assets and we've looked at all of the financing items that deal with long-term liabilities and shareholders equity. So what we know now is that our cash um, from financing activities was an inflow of $400. Okay, so our last piece now is just the final reconciliation. Um, we have to bring some of the numbers back. So we know from uh, operating activities the cash that was generated was 2640, 2640. We know from the investing activities that there was cash used of 3430, right? I'll just kind of draw a line here so that you can see what's going on. And then we have the financing activities uh, of plus 400, so financing activities, 400. So 2640 minus uh, 3430 in investing uh, plus 400, right, is a change in cash of 390, right? I'll just double check that, 2640 minus 3430 plus 400 is 390. And to that, we add the beginning of year cash balance from the balance sheet. And then if we take our cash inflow or outflow, right, net change in cash, plus any beginning balance, 
right? We should end up with the ending balance in cash. And we do because we had a cash, a net cash outflow of 390. Uh, so 390 negative, right? Plus 900 uh, cash at the beginning of the year is our ending year cash. And we nailed this um, uh, to the penny. It, it balances perfectly. And we can check if you look at your cash account, cash had a beginning balance of 900 and went down to 510, right? Well, that means that there had to have been a 390 net outflow in cash. And now we know how that outflow is made up, right? It's made up of 2640 in for financing, right? It's made up of 3430 out for investing. Sorry, this first one I said uh, investing, it's operating. So this is operating, this is investing, and 400 for financing. And um, whatever story you wish to interpret after that is kind of up to you. But basically, the company has uh, relies on bonds. And what it may have done is it repurchased a bond that it was paying a higher rate of interest to and then reissued it at a lower rate. And so that's why these two cancel each other out. It sold some shares, right? So it needed to raise some money from shares. Uh, it also paid a dividend, right? Um, but the company overall is generating positive cash from operating activities and it's using that cash plus any additional cash from financing activities. It's using that to invest in the business. There was the, the, the investment consisted of uh, an actual fair value, uh, NI investment, uh, and some equipment. The equipment was the bigger one. So the company is taking some of its extra leftover cash and putting it into temporary fair value through net income investments and uh, perhaps waiting and, and hoping to make some money off of it. And then we'll reuse that uh, when it needs to later on. But basically the company is performing relatively well, generating positive operating cash and continuing to invest in assets for the future. And so that ends tutorial 22-1 on cash flows using the indirect approach for Quartz Company.